Good morning, everyone. Uh, if we have not met, my name is Charlie Salamone, lead pastor here at Westview Bible Church. And what a time to be alive, right? Quel uh, temps pour vivre. We spent a very interesting two years plus in a global pandemic which for some of us was difficult, for some of us was tragic, for few of us was easy, and finally, after two plus years, for the most part, I think many of us have returned to a somewhat sense of normalcy, and there are many voices saying the pandemic is over, even though COVID is still here. The pandemic way of thinking is over. Well, uh, it's nice that we can now finally get a sense of rest, right? Now it seems like together we can just take that deep breath and feel like, ah, peace, right? As long as you don't Look at the newspaper. <laughs> because if you do, you're going to see words like, uh, here's one I heard this morning, uh, climate catastrophe. That's talking about who knows what, could be any number of things that have recently happened. We had a hurricane hit Canada uh, not that long ago. I'm new here, didn't know that was a thing. Um, climate catastrophe, global recession, uh, oh, and if that wasn't enough, if you've paid attention, the President of the United States have recently used the word nuclear Armageddon in regard to his concerns about the escalating war. So that's why I say, well, what a time to be alive. Uh, quel temps pour vivre. And... With these worldwide concerns, it's natural to long for a sense of peace, right? Well, before we consider how we should respond when we look at the newspaper, because that feeling of unrest, I think, is normal, um, and by the way, those are only the, the global concerns. If your life is anything like mine, you also have your own personal concerns, which a lot of times are bigger, more like in the front of your mind. There's a lot of things in life to be concerned about. How are we to respond to a world full of trouble? So... My great heart for our church is that we are and we would be a missionary church, meaning that we're connecting with people who are not Christians. And my hope is that people are paying attention and listening who don't have a trust relationship with Jesus and they don't see the world the way that the Bible sees the world. And if that's you, I'm so glad you're paying attention. I'm so glad that the Lord has brought you here. And I think if we're coming from different points of view, it would be good and helpful for us to have a starting point that we can agree on. Sometimes people in the church world call that contextualization. If we can find a point of connection, right? And I'm going to say something that I think, no matter where you're at, I think you're going to agree with me. Um, the world is not doing well. I think, that's, I think that's fair. I think you can look at the newspaper, you can look around, and I think pretty much people are going to agree that humanity is not doing a great job and the world is not in a great state. I don't think you're going to find a lot of people that are going to give us a, a good report card, no matter where you're coming from. Things, say it this way, things are not as they ought. If you look around, things are not as they ought. I hope we can agree with that. Now, 
if you agree, and I think everyone will for the most part. I know a lot of people, I used, to, I used to be very much not a believer. I used to think Christianity was ridiculous. But I would have quickly agreed with that idea, uh, the world's not doing well. So, the world's not doing well. Now, if I could ask you to consider, consider a little bit of what the Bible says as to what's going on here. Because, the well, if we're going to respond to the present situation, I think, I think it's very important to ask the question, where did this come from? Because if we can understand where it's coming from, then we're doing more than just treating the symptoms and responding to the symptoms. Then we're actually seeing this for what it really is. So if you would entertain me for a moment and consider, consider this. Now, the Bible does explain why the world is not doing well. The Bible explains that pretty clearly, and it starts in the very beginning. So if this is your first time here, or this is the first time you're hearing about Christianity, it's good timing, actually, because we're going to talk about the beginning for a moment. In the beginning, everything was created as far as people were created, and all this stuff, the physical world was created. And let me tell you this. It was created for a purpose, for a reason. And it's very important that you grasp this. It's been said, and I tend to agree, that one of the great crises, one of the great crises of our present generation is that many people live without a sense of purpose. And for some people, finding pleasure in just the fleeting things like, you know, TikTok and money and such things like that that the world offers, these little pleasures, for some people, that's enough. But for a lot of people, that's not enough. And people are are feeling this sense of meaningless of life. And I dare say some of the crazy things you read about in the newspaper often seem to me like people simply reacting to a sense of there's no point in life and people doing sometimes terrible things out of this sense of what's the point of it all. So anyways, all that to say, the Bible actually says that everything, you, me, all this stuff, it was created for a purpose, a reason, which begs the question, what is the reason? And, well, kind of a, a Bible way of answering that is to say to glorify God. But i got to break that down because right there I probably lost you in the sense of, like, what do you mean to glorify God? Everything exists. Everything exists. Everything was created to glorify God, meaning everything exists for the purpose of us looking around and saying to ourselves out of the depths of our heart, God is amazing. And not only amazing, like, wow, God is good. His character is good. Everything was created so that we would know the heart, the nature of God. God is amazing, and God is good. And when you open up the Bible, that's actually how it begins. In fact, uh, Genesis 1, God's creating everything. Genesis 2 is kind of like a zoom in, God creating everything. But there's a big purpose being preached in Genesis 2. And it's that idea that God is good. All these things I'm creating for you, he created this good place. This world that wasn't messed up. This world that was doing very good. And it, it looked good and it smelled good and it felt good. And there were pleasures and foods and, and, and marriage and many things that were good, and it came with a message. We were supposed to kind of see this good, good place, and we were supposed to say, God is good, and he cares about us. He wants us to be happy. It was supposed to glorify God in the sense of, it was supposed to point to the fact that he wants a relationship with us. We were made for his good pleasure, and we were also made to see how good he was. Now, another way that the Bible would explain this would be we were created to bear the image of God. And meaning to bear the image is kind of like to reflect. Like we see, like we see God is amazing. God is amazing. And by seeing that, we kind of reflect that. Okay? 
So that's kind of why we were created and why everything else was created. We were created to reflect the image of God and all this stuff was created originally to be good and for us to enjoy. And in enjoying the beauty of it, the pleasures of it, the tastes of it, we were supposed to be like, God is good. God is amazing. This whole world testifies that God loves us and that he's good. That's the way it was supposed to be, okay? And that's the way it started, Genesis chapter 2. But then something bad happened. You turn the page. Genesis chapter 3. What happened in Genesis chapter 3? We don't have time to get into the story, but sin entered the world. And if you think sin was just breaking a rule, you got to understand a little more the depths behind it. Sin was people saying, it started with just, you know, one couple saying this in their heart, but we all followed suit. Sin was us saying, I don't want to live for the purpose of God. I want to kind of do it on my own. As in, I kind of want to be in charge of my own life. I kind of want to decide for myself what's good and bad. I kind of want to be my own God. And in our hearts, what sin says is, get him out of there. I kind of want to do this on my own. I don't want everything to be for him. Um... That's kind of what sin does. It takes God off of the throne of being God. And that's that's at the heart of it. You can't look at sin as just a rule. It's kind of, it's about the relationship with God, saying, I don't want him in my heart. I kind of want to try this on my own. That's kind of what happened with sin. And how did God feel when sin entered the world? A lot of people would probably say that that made him angry and he needed to deal with it. And uh, there might have been some of that, but there was a much more uh, greater feeling on the heart of God. And I dare say that I think I actually felt a little bit of it. Just I think I felt a little bit of it a couple weeks ago, uh, what God felt when sin entered the world. Um, my dad came to visit us for the first time since we moved here to Montreal. And like many grandparents, he had it in his heart to spoil his grandchildren. So we went with the little ones to Toys R Us. Perfect place for a grandparent to bring little kids. And my little Josh, okay, my little Josh, he's a unique one. He's a lot of things. One thing he isn't is flexible, okay? Not one bit. Very strong-willed, very gets these blinders on. He'll get focused on something, and you can't talk him out of it. Gets that from his mom. (laughs) That was a joke. He gets it from me, I'll be honest. Um, Gets these blinders on and gets focused, hyper-focused, and he can't see anything other than what he's focused on. And he went into Toys R Us with this idea of getting some sort of little Paw Patrol plastic toy of some sort, and that's what he wanted. We have a ton of Paw Patrol plastic toys around our house and other similar plastic toys that the dog chews up within the first, you know, 20 minutes, and they get scattered and lost. But whatever, he wanted more little plastic Paw Patrol toys. We got into Toys R Us. My, my other little child, I got five of them, three are little, but one of the other little ones goes to the back of the store. You know, they have those, like, uh, cars, those children's cars that have their battery powered that you can actually get in and drive around the yard. Tovaya gets in one of those. Grandpa's heart melts. They're super expensive, but he's like, okay, if you and Josh together want this, we can do it. It's like, what? This is like what every, this is like what every little child this age dreams of. But Josh, all he sees is these little Paw Patrol plastic toys. And he's like, no, I want this. No, I want this. And I'm like, I am feeling probably just a little bit of what God felt when he saw people say, no, I don't want you, God. I just want want what I want. I'm watching this, and I'm watching Josh, and I'm trying to talk him out of this. Like, Josh, you don't understand how happy 
this is going to make you cruising around our backyard with this car. It's a two-seater. You and Tobiah can just cruise all over. You don't know how fun and enjoyable and pleasurable that will be. In contrast, this plastic toy you're going to play with for 15 minutes. You're going to forget about it. It's going to get lost. It's going to get chewed up. But it, I just could not get those blinders off of him. But I just kept trying and trying and trying. And eventually I did. Eventually I did. And we got that thing. It cruises around our backyard. The kids love it. But this is what I'm talking about. Uh, God looked upon people and it's like, you don't, want, you don't want me, the source of infinite joy. You want to do things your own way. That is what God felt. And with great desire, he still wanted to give us, with our blinders on and our stubbornness, he still wanted to give us that great infinite joy. And you know what he did? The what he did in his desire to restore us to joy, what he did might surprise you and might seem counterintuitive. What he did, he cursed the world. Okay? Read about it. Genesis chapter 3. Because of you, because of what you did, the world is now cursed. The ground is cursed. Um, and that, I guess, also needs to be unpacked. What am I talking about? Well, he cursed the world. If you've noticed, and you have, the world is messed up in lots of ways. Um, it's kind of like when God said the ground is cursed, in some ways he was kind of saying, your surroundings is going to match the condition of your heart. Okay? Your heart has become corrupt. The world you're in is also going to be corrupt. And what that means is, we can walk through the specifics of it, thorns and thistles, you know, sweatier brow from dust to dust. But what, it, what, what that's referring to is life's going to be hard. You've discovered this. I don't care where you are, what you come from, how much money you have. Life's going to be hard. Life's going to be painful, okay? Sweatier brow, thorns, thistles. Life's going to be frustrating, Okay? And there's no escaping that. Life's going to be hard, painful, frustrating, and the worst of it is, from dust to dust, you're going to die. That's the curse on the ground, and God did it. And he did it not out of anger. He did it in hope. And we'll get to that. I get that from Romans 8, 20 specifically. He did it in hope. He did it out of love. But he did it. What? 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 Why would he curse the ground? Why would he make life hard? Actually, you turn the page. We're going to get to John. I know we're in a series on John. We're working there. We're going to get there. Turn the page. Genesis chapter 4, right? Sin increases. Okay? Genesis chapter 3 seems like a little thing. Ate a piece of fruit. Genesis chapter 4, you know, you got the first siblings. One killing the other one. Murder. Sin increases. And much of the chapter is about that. Cain killing his brother. It's about sin increasing, murder. But as the scriptures say, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Meaning God's goodness, goodness and kindness is also seen. And so you read Genesis chapter 4 about sin, murder, but then right at the end, there's a, there's a few words that are easy to miss. Right at the end of Genesis chapter 4, it says, at this time, people began calling upon the name of the Lord. And with that means, that calling upon. That's also the Hebrews crying out. They began crying out to him. And here we have the curse beginning to do what the curse was meant to do. It's kind of like people saying, I just want to do it on my own. I want to live on my own. I don't need God. But then sometimes circumstances, situations, things start to feel hard, painful, frustrating. And sometimes, sometimes our eyes begin to open, the blinders begin to fall off, and we cry out, God, I need you, I need you. This was a bad idea, trying to do this on my own, trying to live without you. Lord, come into my life. People began crying out and calling upon the name of the Lord. And you have that, all throughout the Old Testament. While sin increases, while darkness increases, while the world goes from bad to worse, and the hearts of people from bad to worse, there is a remnant, there is people crying out and God responding. And the, the, the fulfillment of him in how he responds, 
how he responds to those generations of people crying out, crying out, crying out, is to send his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to take the curse, to take away the curse, the curse that was placed upon the ground, upon the world, thorns, thistles, from dust to dust, pain, frustration, death. He sent Jesus to take it all by taking our sin upon himself, paying for our sins, nailing it to the cross. And he rose from the dead, and in him there's the hope of new life, which I suppose I will get to in time. Okay, let's fast forward. Um, let's fast forward. Uh, John chapter 14, that's where we are. Um, Jesus uh, uh, is talking to his disciples before he goes to the cross. He says, we're going to pick it up in verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Okay, so uh, a bunch of verses here. There's actually three or four ideas that are repeated. So in order to uh, break down this, uh, let's just address these, these concepts that are repeated, you know, in these nine verses. Uh, one of the concepts that's repeated is this idea of, uh, if you love me, keep my commands. Keep my commands. He's talking about uh, sending the Holy Spirit, which we get to, but there is kind of a, a little bit of a contingent. Like, if you love me, if you love me, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to be with you. If, you. if you love me and you obey my commands. Now, that really needs to be understood because if it's not understood, you could get something very wrong and you could miss the heart of the message. Uh, if you think, okay, well, Jesus is a bunch of commands and we got to do them and there's a certain score we got to meet you know, maybe it's like a passing score. Hope it's like 60%, okay? Because if it's 70 or 80% or 90, things are going to get maybe bad for me. That's not what this says. Don't think in terms of like his commands being a bunch of rules and we all get a different score. That's not the gospel message. In actuality, um, what this is talking about, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. He's talking about a certain posture in life. And you see this uh, lots of ways all over the Bible. You have people, when it comes to God who are listening and you have people who are stopping up their ears and not listening, okay? It's kind of willful one way or another, to be honest, in the heart. You have people who are looking to him, saying, Lord, show me, change me, okay? Work on my heart. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I need your help, okay? They're looking and they're seeking. Ask, seek, knock. Everyone who, who, who looks and seeks, finds him. Everyone who knocks, the door is going to be open. Okay? Uh, seeking, you will find. If you're looking to him, you're going to hear him. You're going to experience him. You're going to love him. But if you're covering up your eyes and you're keeping those blinders on, you're not going to see him. That's really all this is talking about, is those who have hearts that are open and those who have hearts that are closed. Uh, when it comes to, like, obeying me. It's really about what the, what the Greeks actually, if you keep my word, if you hold to my word, okay? So it, it basically means, like, Lord, put your word in me. It, it's, it's simply a posture in life. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, sec, the second thing that's repeated in a bunch of ways, this is kind of like, if you have that posture, um, here's what's going to happen. Um, it's interesting how this is worded, actually. He says he's going to come to us. Um, in verse 15, he actually says, or, or verse 16, he says, he's going to give you another 
Uh, sometimes it's translated counselor, sometimes helper, advocate. Uh, paraclete is, is, is the Greek long discussion we could have. But he's talking about sending the Holy Spirit. Okay, if you love me, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's going to be with you. Okay? But it's really interesting because then you keep reading, and then later he says, uh, in verse 18, he says, I will come to you. Okay, I'm going to come to you personally. And then you keep reading, you get to verse 23. He says, the Father and me, we're both going to come to you. And it's really interesting. You put these together. It's kind of like, uh, uh, this is like a, a Trinitarian concept. And if you don't know what I'm getting at, well, we're going to save that conversation for another time. It's, uh, but that's a, a, a huge theological concept that uh, God exists in three persons. He has eternally existed in three persons. And here Jesus is basically saying, uh, myself, the Holy Spirit, the Father, we will all come to you. You're going to experience this oneness the way that we have oneness. Okay, we're going to come to you. And not only that, repeated in this, is not only that he's going to come to us. If we have this posture of, Lord, I need you, I want you, I'm feeling the effects of this pain everywhere. If you, if you have that attitude of crying out like you see in Genesis chapter 4, not only is the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit going to come to you, but it's going to be an experience. It's not just going to be some like theological thing that happens secretly. It's going to be an experience. He actually says it three times in verse 19, verse 20, verse 21. Verse 19 says, you will see me. Uh, verse 20 says, you will realize it's true. I am in you. You are in me. You're going to know it's true. Uh, verse 23, uh, verse 21. We, we will show ourselves to you. You're going to see. What happened when sin entered the world? What happened to people? Their hearts went black. Cover their eyes. Keep the blinders on. Don't want God. Kind of want to do things on my own. Turn that posture and say, Lord, I need you. And what happens is the intended purpose of it all begins to be restored. We were created. What did I say we were created for? To see in him, to see when we look around and see everything, our hearts were supposed to say, God is real. God's amazing. God is good. His character is good. Oh, how wonderful it is to be known and to know and to walk with this God of love. That's what we were created for. And, and here Jesus is saying, if you want it, if you want me, this can be restored. You will see. Um, another thing that is, is spoken of um, uh, a number of times in these nine verses is this contrast between you're going to see the world's not going to see. Um, you're going to see the world's not going to see because the world cannot accept him as in the spirit of truth because it neither sees him nor knows him. And this is the same idea we've been talking about. There's a spirit of truth. The world can't see him. And why can't the world see the spirit of truth? Because it doesn't want to doesn't want to. Hey, there's truth here from God. No, thank you. Don't want to look at it. Don't want to think about it. And this, if we're not careful, this is a natural way that many of us live our lives. This is the way all of us live our lives if we're not careful. This is why Jesus said a man must be born again if he wants to see the kingdom. These blinders need to be removed. Truth. Truth. This is something that I say a lot. When it comes to like ultimate reality, God is not hiding. We're the ones that are hiding. And there is this invitation, come out from hiding and have your sins forgiven. And that truly is the Christian message. Okay, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Verse 25, Jesus is still speaking. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And hear this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Peace peace. Look around. Everything's going wrong. World's going wrong. Things are getting hard. I got my own personal concerns. Where is someone supposed to find peace? And Jesus is saying, my peace I give you. Oh, this is what I want for us. This is what I want for us to feel. Because again, this is something to be experienced, to be seen. How can we get there? You know, at this point, um, 
part of our conversation on our preaching team. Uh, uh, this, this, this came out a really good question. Um, there's a lot of people that would read this and would hear about this. And I'm talking about people who are Christians now. People who like believe and they hold to the message. They would hear this and instead of this bringing a sense of peace, it can easily bring a sense of like guilt. Like, yeah, but I don't have peace. Yeah, but I don't feel peace. I've been a Christian for like a long time and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an anxious person. I feel you. I'm probably more of an anxious person than you, I'm gonna be honest. I probably worry more than you. Full confession. I probably do. All right? Something I inherited from my mom. Uh, I, I worry a lot. A lot of things I worry about I don't need to be worrying about. I probably worry more than you. So what about this? My peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. How do we make sense of that? So where I come from, Wisconsin, um, in the southeastern, um, or southwestern, southwestern part of the state, there is this uh, well-known bike trail. It's 50 miles. It's called the Elroy Sparta Bike Trail. And um, it's an old railroad track that they removed. And some of the highlights of the Elroy Sparta bike trail is there are these tunnels that go through the hills. And some of the tunnels are really long. There's one tunnel that's like almost like a mile long. And uh, even if you have a headlight, you can't ride your bike through the tunnel. You got to walk it uh, because it's just so dark in there. It's dark and it's cold, deep in the hills, deep in the ground. It's dark and it's cold. And it's really easy to feel just kind of like swallowed up by that feeling of just cold darkness. But right from the beginning, there's this tiny speck of light and as you're walking through this long stretch of cold darkness, all you can do is just keep looking at that light and knowing you're going to make it to the other side. You, you look at it. Focus on it. Focus on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel the coldness. I feel the darkness, especially when I take my eyes off of that. And I just got to bring my mind back. And this is really what I think much of this Christian life feels like. I got lots of things I'm worrying about. Lots of things. And when I'm feeling that cold darkness, I got to just focus, remember. And sometimes all I can see is that tiny little speck. Sometimes, sometimes I have my moments where I feel like the light's everywhere. And I'm just like singing for joy. But other times, I'm just in a tunnel. And I'm just trying to focus on that tiny little speck. A lot of times, the spec, what I'm doing is I'm looking. What, what does God's word say about this situation? What does he say? And that's actually a lot of what Jesus says here. Uh, he's going to teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. It's the very reason why we need to be absorbing the scriptures in our heart so the Holy Spirit can remind us of these truths when we're walking through the tunnel. Don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And you know something really interesting? You know something really interesting? I came across this other verse as I was thinking about all this. Okay, Matthew 24, verse 6 through 8. Hear this. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. And you know why I thought that was so interesting? Because I realize, like, the three, like, big global concerns right now can really be boiled down to the exact things that Jesus is talking about. Like earthquakes, natural disasters, what, might, what someone might call climate catastroph catastrophes, uh, um, uh, famines, global recession. What are the things that we're really worried about here? Not having the things we might need. 
Uh, wars and rumors of wars. There are definitely wars going on. And then you have people having conversations about possible nuclear Armageddon in the future. Wars and rumors of wars. It sounds a, a lot like the things that are written down here, doesn't it? You're gonna, this is going to happen, Jesus says. But see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen. Things are playing out according to his plan. And, and what, what do you mean, Jesus? Well, verse 8, these are the beginning of birth pains. We're walking through a tunnel, and we're getting closer to our destination. One more passage for you. It's going to connect this, hopefully bring it all together. Verse 18 to 23 of Romans 8. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship. The redemption of our bodies. Okay, there's a lot of stuff here. A lot of stuff here. Don't have time to walk through it all specifically. But a couple things I do want you to catch. It's the same idea. The whole, what Jesus said earlier, these are, are, but are yet the beginnings of birth pains. There's an idea that this is all leading to something. Okay? Um, uh, uh, Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. It talks about, uh, uh, in verse 20, the creation was subjected to frustration. That's what happened in Genesis chapter 3. That's when curse was placed upon the world. Things would be frustrating. Things would be hard. The world would be painful. All this, he says, can be boiled down to what someone might experience in the birth of a child. Now, I haven't physically gone through that, obviously, but I've seen it five times, and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse until it becomes wonderful. And you get through that pain with that focus of where this is headed. And here, here he's saying this is all leading to something, okay? The hardness in the world, it's leading to something wonderful. And the wonderful thing is the redemption of it all, the restoration of it all, everything redeemed, everything restored, and the revealing of the children of God. Um, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait. This pain, the pain, the hardships that we have Feel the frustrations. It's doing something in us. It's doing something in us. It's helping us and preparing us to look. I go through my life. Things are going good. Things are going good. I'm just focused on this present world. Things start to get hard. Things start to get harder. I look at the newspaper. I start to get scared. I look at the light, the little pinpoint of light. And I find a joy that is not to be found, even when things are going good here. We wait eagerly. That's what this is doing in us. It's focusing us to wait inwardly. And it's not just a waiting. It is a waiting. Not only so, but we ourselves, hear this, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption of sonship, the redemption of our bodies. The light that's at the end of this tunnel that we're waiting for, it's the redemption of all things, the restoration of all things, physically, including our bodies. Raised from the dead, here on earth, things will be as they were written down in Genesis chapter 2, and even better. We are heading towards a creation that is good. It's all going to happen here. And now, through the Holy Spirit, that speck of light, we can see it. This isn't just religious story time. By the power of the Holy Spirit, if your heart is open to him, you can see it. Focus on it. Maybe it's just a pinpoint. Maybe it's just a pinpoint. Focus on it. We have the first fruits. This is the promise. You will see. You will see. A lot of times, lately, when our prayer team comes up, 
and I encourage you to come and they'll lay hands on you and pray, that's the first thing that I want them praying for, and that's the first thing I want your heart looking for. Lord, I need to see more. I need to see more. Yeah, you got problems in this life. I get it. I do too. You want help with those problems in life. I get it. I do too. But you know what you need even more? You need to see more. You need to see more of that light because that ultimately is what this is all preparing us for. And then you can walk through these hardships knowing where you're heading with a joy that can't be shaken, a joy that's just going to get brighter and brighter. Father God, help us see. Help us see more of you, Lord, as we look around and we see the world is not as it ought to be as we feel the darkness, the cold, Lord. Help us look and help us see Give us hearts that are soft, hearts that are longing for you. And Lord, do as your scriptures say that you will do. Come to us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, come to us. Let us know that you are in us and we are in you. Let us see. And as we walk through the pain, Lord, give us the joy of knowing what is coming. Give us a glimpse of the restoration of all things. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to go into our time of question and answer, and if you would like to explore this more fully with Charlie right now, this is your chance. So we have a few minutes. Uh, you can text the uh, question you have to the number on the screen, and I'll get that on my phone, or we have a mic that's going to wander around, and if you have a, a question in the room and want to ask it live, you can also do that. So just raise your hand in the room and, or text a question in, and uh, yeah, does anyone have a question to begin us off? Okay, right down here. Hi, Charlie, a great sermon. Um, when you talked about the Holy Spirit and the experience, um, I, I just found that, that for me, it's a, it's a different experience for everybody. Um, I know some people seem to really uh, be impacted immediately. I know for myself, it's been a long road that I've that I've gone down to to finally feel or see what the what the Holy Spirit has done in my life. Um, could you just talk a bit more about that? How it might be different for uh, for everybody? That's a, a great point. It is different. And actually, if there's one thing that you see in the book of Acts, is that the Holy Spirit acts the way the Holy Spirit wants to act. A lot of times we want to set a specific like model of how the Holy Spirit works, and you really can't. Sometimes the Holy Spirit falls upon people when they're hearing the Word of God. Sometimes the Holy Spirit falls upon people with power when they're getting baptized. Uh, um, sometimes the Holy Spirit falls upon people with power when someone's laying hands on them in praying, and I think if there's one thing you can gather from that is the Holy Spirit is a person, and you can't necessarily just say this is how he always acts. I think there's principles you can play, but there's not like a one-size-fits-all, and you also see that. It's one of the big points of 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12 uh, to 14. Uh, there are many gifts, but one Spirit. Uh, the Spirit manifests himself in different ways to different people, and that's good. And I definitely think there is an element of temperament, the way that God has made us. There are some people that naturally long for those, like, intense experiences, like, Holy Spirit, I want to experience you. And some people, that makes them a little nervous. <laughs> and, and I think God has just made us different, and, and I think that's okay. Um, but... What we share and what we should share as Christians is that longing for more, okay? Maybe you don't long to be just rocked and just thrown on the floor in like supernatural ecstasies like I do, to be honest. Like I, I want that. Maybe for you it's like that's a little intimidating, but I would like to see some more, Lord. <laughs> you know, people are different, okay? That's fine. That's fine. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. All right, if you have another question in the room, you can raise your hand. I have something came through on the text line that just says hello. So hello to you, Charlie, I guess. <laughs> I don't know who that was, but hello. Um, can you talk practically about how, like, if we're feeling anxious, like, how do we 
How do we refocus in a practical way? Like, what are the steps we take? Well, interestingly, Cheryl, I was actually expecting you to do that next week when you talk about uh, abiding uh, and some practical things. So um, I'm just going to, like, pass the ball back okay, to you on we'll that one. Okay, we'll come back next week <laughs> to find that, that, the answer to that question. There's a lot of things. <laughs> well, a big thing when it comes to what we've talked about today is read the Bible. Because the Holy Spirit, like he said, he'll re remind you of things that I've spoken of. Those are just kind of like seeds you're eating. And uh, maybe when you're reading, it won't make a whole lot of sense or it might not really feel relevant. And then suddenly you'll be in a circumstance where, oh, okay, yeah. All right. We have a question back here, Barb. And we'll make this the last question. I'm going to go off script just a little bit. We were asked a question in our home group, or we there was a question in our home group this week that we were wrestling with, and we, um, and it is, um, it says in scripture that if you speak against God the Father, if you speak against the Son, you can be forgiven, but blaspheming the Holy Spirit is not forgiven, and I'm paraphrasing, yep. but could you speak a little bit to that? Sure, I'll try to be brief. I'll tell you that I have studied this passage and the ones connected to it perhaps more than any other single passage of Scripture because uh, for years, actually, I lived under a, a reoccurring fear that I had actually committed this sin in my previous life as a non-believer during the arguments I would get into Christians and the blasphemies, I would say, to be honest. Um, so uh, uh, so I, I say that with a little comfort if there is someone who's actually like, oh, I've read that, and that verse super scares me. Um, oh, for the sake of time, um, I can't unpack everything that I've studied in regards to this, but I try to be as brief as possible. Um, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's interesting because Jesus says, first, all sins and blasphemies can be, com can be forgiven, period. First, he says it without uh, any qualification, without any uh, exception. He says it as, as if it's a full statement without any exceptions to it. All sins and blasphemy can be forgiven, period. And then he also says, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven in this life or in the life to come. And something interesting is both of these statements are true. How can both of them be true? Well, Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, as I understand it, is something where the Holy Spirit is the one calling us. The Holy Spirit is the one saying, come, come, come to him. I actually suspect there are people in the room, perhaps for the very first time in their life, who are experiencing the Holy Spirit. That call, come to him, come to God, come to Jesus, be forgiven. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit working on your heart. And blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, I don't think it's about, like, a certain phrase. I don't think it's like, well, if you say this, you can be forgiven. If you say this, then you're done. It's more about a heart that says, I've decided, no, I don't want you. And the Holy Spirit, who's the one inviting and calling, the Holy Spirit leaves. And the way that I understand it is that can put you in a place where you can be forgiven if you want to be forgiven. But your heart has become so hard that you'll never come to him. So when it comes to blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, it never applies. There's never a circumstance where someone is saying, hey, I want to be forgiven. I want to be forgiven. No, you did the unforgivable sin. That's not what it is. But in actuality, it's a heart condition by which the heart becomes so hard that it's a point of no return. That's the way I understand it. And it is something for us to be concerned about in the sense of... Um, what does the scripture say? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the days of the rebellion. For today is the day of salvation. This is how it applies. When you hear his voice calling you, don't say no. Don't harden your heart. Because uh, there is a point of no return. And I don't think anyone knows where that is. But that's, that's the way I understand it. Great. Well, um, if you do have a question that comes to mind, you can still text it into our text line. We look at those throughout the week. So feel free to do that. Let me just close us in prayer. Father, thank you that you have given us peace and that it is available to us and that we can just look to you 
and we can take hold of that peace no matter what is happening around us. I think of Peter stepping off the boat into the, the waves and the, the stormy seas and, and being able to walk on water as long as he looked at Jesus. And I pray that you would um, fix our eyes on you, Father, that you would teach us to do that. Father, I pray that uh, you would help us to stay strong in you uh, no matter what is happening in the world around us, know the challenges in our lives, Father, that we would experience your peace and we pray for more of that, more and more and more, to see your glory, as Charlie was talking about, to see who you are, to, to know your goodness in real, real ways. We pray this in Jesus' name.